Hi, boys and girls. In our last read aloud, we heard about how Lewis and Clark prepared for their expedition west. Remember that they got all the men together for their core of discovery and they gathered their supplies. This is a picture of them setting off down the Missouri River. Let's look at a map real quick and look at some important things. Uh, this is the United States today. Remember that the Atlantic Ocean is here next to the original 13 colonies. The Pacific Ocean is on the other side of our country. The Appalachian Mountains run right through here where Daniel Boone had to cross and made the Wilderness Road. <clears throat> the Mississippi River runs up through here. The Rocky Mountains are out west. This is the area of the Louisiana Purchase. The Missouri River goes this way. And today's read aloud takes part, takes place in a part of the United States that we call the Great Plains. The Great Plains is made up of these states here. Plains are <clears throat> really flat land. And well, not a lot of pioneer families who lived in the United States had traveled out into this part of the Louisiana territory. Many Native Americans had already been living there for a very long time. Do you remember what tasks Lewis and Clark were asked to accomplish on their expedition? Well, they were asked to make friends with Native Americans, to find an all water route to the Pacific Ocean, and to collect samples of plants and animals. So in today's read aloud, Lewis and Clark will have an opportunity to accomplish two of these three tasks. I want you to listen carefully to find out which two tasks Lewis and Clark will have an opportunity to accomplish and whether or not they will be successful. <clears throat> On July 19th, 1804, William Clark found himself at the edge of an ocean. It was not the Pacific Ocean, the vast sea to the west that Clark and his friends hoped to reach. In fact, it was not an ocean of water at all. It was a large, flat area of land covered in grass called a prairie. A prairie, boys and girls, is also called a grassland, which we learned about when we studied the African savanna. A prairie goes on as far as the eye can see, just like the ocean. Clark was out hunting for the expedition and spotted some elk tracks, which he followed up a hill. He later described what he found at the top. I came suddenly into an open and boundless prairie. I could not see the edges in any direction. This was so sudden and entertaining that I forgot the elk I had been following. <clears throat> Clark had reached the eastern edge of what today we call the Great Plains. Wild grass as high as Clark's knees stretched out and blew gently in the wind, interrupted every so often by a hill or a grove of trees. That sea of grass stretched all the way to the distant Rocky Mountains, which it would take the core of discovery weeks more to reach. During those weeks, the explorers saw many plants and animals new to them. Meriwether Lewis was especially fascinated by the pronghorn antelope, called pronghorns for short. He tried to get close enough to draw pictures of them, but the pronghorns always ran away. Pronghorns have incredibly sharp eyesight <clears throat> and a strong sense of smell to warn them of approaching danger. When Lewis finally came close to a pronghorn and got a good look at the long, curved horns that gave the animal its name, he wrote, 
The speed of this animal is equal, if not superior, to that of the finest racing horse. The pronghorn is my favorite of all the animals we have encountered so far. <clears throat> so it was a very fast animal. Look at this little guy. <clears throat> Excuse me. The explorers were also astonished by the prairie dog, a tiny rodent. These little creatures, related to squirrels, lived together by the thousands in what the men came to call prairie dog towns. The prairie dog towns consisted of underground tunnels that sometimes stretched out for miles across the flat plains. We have to catch one of these to send back to President Jefferson, William Clark declared. But catching a prairie dog was not so easy. One prairie dog, standing guard above its hole in the ground, saw the men coming and chirped a high-pitched warning. Instantly, all the creatures dived down into the ground. The men dug down after them, but found that the tunnels went down more than six feet below the surface, spreading out in all directions with emergency exits to escape their many predators, hawks, coyotes, and snakes all of whom considered prairie dogs to be delicious snacks. Clark wrote down their findings about the prairie dog and pronghorn antelope in his journal. Still following the Missouri River across the prairie, the expedition moved on. Soon they began to meet new tribes of Native Americans. Most were friendly and welcoming, especially one tribe called the Yankton Sioux. A few of the Yanktons guided the travelers for a few days, but then said, you are coming to the land, <clears throat> excuse me, you are coming to the land of the Teton Sioux. We will not be able to guide you any longer. <clears throat> Lewis and Clark had already heard <clears throat> about the Teton Sioux. President Jefferson wanted them to become friends with the Teton Sioux. However, the Teton Sioux were not interested in trade with the settlers and did not want to allow Lewis and Clark on their land. One September afternoon, John Coulter, one of the expedition's best hunters, was following the tracks of an animal. Coulter dismounted from or got off of his horse to look more closely. Some Teton Sioux, hiding among the nearby trees on their own horses, shouted and rushed forward, riding off with Coulter's horse. Coulter walked back to the river and reported to Lewis and Clark what had happened. Minutes later, five Teton Sioux appeared on the shore, calling out to talk to Lewis and Clark. Captain Clark answered, we will not speak with you until our horse is returned. Well, that wasn't very nice, was it? That they took the horse? What do you think will happen? Oh. Minutes later, more than 200 Teton warriors, all armed with bows and arrows, rode out from the trees and spread out along the river bank. Oh, the Teton Sioux are prepared to fight to protect their land. Captain Lewis remembered that President Jefferson wanted them to be friends with the Teton Sioux. He quietly ordered, stop the boats and hold them steady here in the middle of the river. Clark, smiling, called, we come as friends from our great chief. The chief that Clark was talking about was President Jefferson. We invite your chiefs to come and see our great boat. Clark ordered a few sailors to row him to shore in a pirogue, and after greeting the three main chiefs, Clark brought two of them aboard the keel boat. Remember, the keel boat is the bigger boat. There, he and Lewis were friendly to the Teton Sioux and gave them gifts. Then Clark and the oarsmen took the chiefs back to the shore. Meanwhile, Captain Lewis stood ready on the keelboat's bow, 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 
sorry. And his soldiers kept rifles in their hands or right by their sides in case of trouble. See them out here on the boat? They're not sure this is going to end well. Everything seemed to be going well until suddenly one chief shouted, your gifts are not good enough. You may not return to your big boat until you give, give us better gifts. Sioux warriors grabbed the pirogue's rope and held it securely. Clark knew that the Teton Sioux honored courage. That means they admired and respected people who acted bravely. If he showed any sign of weakness at this moment, the Tetons might attack. Even if there were no fight, any chance of a strong friendship with the Tetons could disappear. Clark whipped his sword out and, holding it high, firmly demanded, release our boat at once. Back on the keelboat, Lewis ordered his men, prepare arms. That means guns. Only on my order may you fire and not a second before. Instantly, the soldiers raised their rifles. In answer, the Tetons raised their bows and set arrows, ready to shoot at the core of Discovery. No one moved. The silence stretched out for a long, tense moment. Then a Sioux chief told the warriors holding the rope, let go. They obeyed. Clark told his oarsmen, Return to the keelboat. One of his men asked quietly, Without you, sir? I gave you an order, Clark said in a voice that sounded much calmer than he actually felt. So he's telling his men, like this guy here, to take the boat, the little boat, the pirogue, and go back to the keelboat without him. I wonder what he has planned. As the pirogue pushed off from the riverbank, Teton warriors surrounded Clark. Lewis could see only his friend's hat over the shoulders of the Sioux. Lewis gave orders, and as the pirogue reached the keelboat, a number of armed soldiers got into the pirogue and started back for Clark. But then, suddenly, the Tetons moved away from Clark. Clark's bravery had impressed the Tetons. The Tetons thought that Clark was brave because he had stood up to them. They smiled in friendship and invited the members of the expedition to their village. The explorers accepted the invitation. The Corps of Discovery had survived a dangerous situation. What they did not know was that even greater dangers and even greater victories still lay ahead. Wow, that was a good story, wasn't it, boys and girls? Very suspenseful. I didn't know what was going to happen. So today's read aloud took place in the Great Plains where Lewis and Clark encountered pronghorns and prairie dogs. They also encountered the Yankton Sioux and the Teton Sioux. Their meetings with the two tribes were different because the Yankton Sioux were immediately friendly with them and they helped guide the Corps of Discovery for several days. They led them. But the Teton Sioux did not want to be friends at first. They were prepared to fight. But in the end, remember, because of Clark's bravery, they became friends with the Teton Sioux. So, Lewis and Clark accomplished ouch, two of their tasks, or partially accomplished two of their tasks. They had three tasks to do. Make friends with Native Americans. Find an all-water route to the Pacific Ocean. And collect, collecty, collect samples of plants and animals. Let's... Uh, review what they did in this read aloud and we will add to this next time okay so 
the Native Americans that they made friends with eventually were the Yankton Sioux. I bet you didn't think it was spelled that way, did you? And after that tense confrontation, the Teton Sioux. Hi. They were not able to collect samples of plants and animals, but they did write about them and draw pictures of them. Which two animals? Pronghorn antelope and prairie dogs. Very good. Now, because, just because Lewis and Clark accomplished two of the tasks in today's read aloud doesn't mean they won't encounter more things related to each task as the expedition continues. I wonder if tomorrow's read aloud is going to be as exciting as today's. I sure hope so. Until then, boys and girls, goodbye.